partner, welcome back to Race Dental Race Academy series of webinar programs for this year. It's been an exciting start to the year. Many things happening, many things changing, a lot of work. Uh, we've gone from zero to hero pretty fast. So welcome back. Whilst we're waiting for everyone else to get back online, I'd like to welcome, as usual, our guests. We have a number of guests across the world today from Australia, the USA, Japan, New Zealand, Taiwan, Singapore, and Malaysia. So welcome one, welcome all. I love the globalization that today's technology enables us to catch into. And whilst we're waiting, I'd like to introduce Shirley, who's with us today. Shirley's our technical specialist who does all of our uh, scanning installs and her wealth of knowledge of us to join us today should we have any curly questions that I can't answer. So say hello to Shirley. Shirley, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Shirley. As Matt said, I do all the scanner installs and trainings. That's fantastic. We, we love having you guys on board, um, especially when I get the curveball for an install or a tricky detailed scan, Shirley. I appreciate <laughs> yep. you coming on board and helping us with any questions we have today. We seem to have uh, an enormous amount of people today. It's an exciting um, topic for prepping for today's technology and scanning tips and tricks and those little things we can do and look out for to make sure that uh, our first impression is our last impression. So let's get started. I'm just going to turn this off now. We've got questions coming through already, so I'll ask Shirley to, um, uh, to monitor those and we'll uh, go through those at the end. So... Um, Preparation and scanning and impressions, it's all paramount to the success of, uh, of any restoration. Uh, and But this is something I've put together uh, in regards to the first part we cover is preparations. And this is a technician's perspective. Uh, so let's get started now. So people ask me, what sort of preparation should I do? And we'll talk detail about um, the pros and cons of each of the many types. But basically, a preparation should, guide, should be guided by the diagnostic workup. And it should be reproduce should reproduce the, the final restoration. Um, we really need to work backwards. We used to cut a prep, make a tooth fit. These days, we sort of strongly focus, especially with big cases or implant cases or big veneer cases, full mouth reconstruction. We were to work backwards and retrofit the preparation into the final design that the technician and clinician have decided upon that suits the patient, uh, get the design of the restoration and retrofit the preparation into that. So all your preparation should be guided by a diagnostic wax up or these days what we call the diagnostic print up. All our diagnostics are done digitally now. Our models are 3D printed. Gone are the days of wax, uh, Bunsen's, those sorts of things. We have a much better way of reproducing nature with our digital technology and the importation of natural dentition um, by use of implant libraries with our digital uh, design technology. So let's talk preparation. And here's a preparation from old school. When I was first raised 30 years ago on, on Crown and Bridge, um, you know, our 2 to 2.5 millimetres occlusally or incisally, our 2 millimetre reduction buccally or lingually or through the proximal areas, um, a 360 chamfer, or shoulder margin with a four to six, preferably seven degree taper for that retention component. Um, three millimeters minimum of retentive height. I mean, those, uh, it's nice to have, but it's pretty aggressive and probably unnecessary for, uh, for today's um, materials and material science. So that two and a half millimeters occlusally and two millimeters uh, approximately is probably unnecessary. Great for porcelain fused to metal or porcelain fused to zirconia or the layered restorations that we really need to aggressively reduce the preparation to give sufficient space for the restoration and the correct emergence profile for the soft tissue adhesion around the margin and uh, um, uh, an emergence profile of that crown. But these days, totally unnecessary. The monolithic restorations to the, of today mean far less tooth preparation. We can achieve exactly the same result, exactly the same emergence profile, a soft tissue adherence, all with half a millimetre of reduction as opposed to the 1.5 or 2 or 2.5 we needed yesterday. So the less aggressive or minimally invasive preparations uh, that today with today's materials are far more popular. The benefits of this are endless. I could sit here for a whole new um, presentation on the benefits of minimally invasive dentistry, but I'm sure you all know and probably agree that minimally invasive is the future. So now 
0.5 millimetre reduction all over has become the new norm. So today's most requested materials and prepping for today's technology, first we probably should understand uh, the most requested materials, understand the material science, their capabilities and their inhibitions. The uh, monolithic translucent zirconia, or what we brand as opalite. Opalite's probably, or is Australia's number one requested crown. Um, at, a, at a recommended strength at 0 0.5, we can still give a, a 15 year warranty at, at um, half a millimetre thick. And currently we're doing about 35 to 40, 35% of our work at race in monolithic translucent zirconia. Um, our, we also do monolithic super translucent zirconia, which is the same thing, but more aesthetic. It has the same translucency as uh, lithium disilicate or what some of you guys would know, uh, brands such as Emacs. Um, we call that crystallite super, tra uh, super translucent zirconia. We can give a 15-year warranty at 0.5 a millimetre uh, and still maintain absolute aesthetics. About, again, 35% of our work here is done in crystallite. So opalites reserved for strong restorations or long span bridges, crystallites reserved for single anteriors or short span bridges where added a translucency and aesthetics is required. Um, and again, so all up monolithic zirconia in our lab equates to around 70% of the work we do here. And those sorts of demand we've seen trending across the globe. Um, and there's no doubt I had a crown put in uh, just before Christmas and I had a monolithic super translucent zirconia crystallite restoration um, and super happy with it. I understand why it's fast becoming the global standard. Then about 25% of, of the work done in our lab is in lithium disilicate. We brand ours as Emax. Uh, I think it's a great product. It's very translucent. It can be etched, so it's fantastic for veneers and fantastic for preparations with um, not a lot of tooth structure left because it can be etched, uh, we can be bonded and therefore our restoration can stay in more. But around 25% of our work's done in Emacs, uh, in Emacs CAD, and we can still provide the uh, warranties uh, that Ivoclar recommend at 0 0.7 or 7 tenths of a millimetre. So again, another great product and you can see uh, these materials have, have now become the, um, the industry standard across the globe. Try to use a technology that's industrial. Some of the smaller plastic boxes that mill these restorations can be probably improved upon. So industrial milling um, capabilities uh, and, and, and quality produced zirconia uh, can get these beautiful results. So let's talk about uh, prepping for the black triangle. Um, and the black triangle being the interproximal uh, embrasure up in the cervical third. Um, we do keep informing our dentists that um, if you do need to close a diastema or close a black triangle, you really need to um, prepare the tooth margin subgingivally. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a equa or supragingival preparation. We have to emerge that preparation off the tooth and to get contact, we end up with a black triangle. On the right-hand side, you'll see if we do have a subgingival preparation on both sides, we can give a natural emergence profile off the tooth, make contact with the adjacent tooth and close that black, trial down, that black triangle down sufficiently. So whenever closing black triangles, please remember it needs to be reasonably deep subgingival margin preparation to enable us to close the black triangle without aggressive food traps. We'll talk a little more detail as we track. So when closing the black triangle, there is a rule that Dr. Tarnow from New York brought out that stipulates that if the distance between the cortical bone and the top of the contact area is less than five millimetres, we have an 86% chance of soft tissue migration or of that soft tissue filling in that area there. If it, the distance between the cortical bone and the top of the contact area does increase from to six millimetres or more, that goes crashing down to around 20% chance of that soft tissue filling in that inapproximable papilla area. So if your clinicians are listening, feel free to put a probe down and tell your technician uh, the depth 
uh, of the gingiva or uh, at least the depth of the gingiva so the technician can decide on how high or how low he or she needs to put that contact area between two restorations or a restoration and natural tooth. Closing diastemas is exactly the same. Here's some beautiful preparations, a fantastic piece of craftsmanship. Unfortunately, not what we need technically to provide a solution to close those black triangles and close those diastemas efficiently. And I, it saddens me when I see this much craft go in, this much work go into this clinician's craft, beautiful margins, everything required except the science behind what's needed to close those gaps. So let's look at that incisally or from the occlusal view. We've got some preparations here for veneers. Again, some nice work, some highly distinguished margins, a lot of craftsmanship gone to, into a result that can't be used. If I highlight these margins here in yellow, you'll see where the dentist has prepared these teeth. And now we can see the challenge we face as technicians in closing those diastemas without creating food traps. And these black lines present the emergence profile off the natural tooth from those veneers, which in turn becomes chronic food traps in the palatal regions. So please think about this when you're closing diastemas or closing black triangles. You really need to prep through and cut through your preps, and I'll show you how far. Here's a good example again of a, of a, um, a veneer preparation. You'll see here, here's where the tooth on the right-hand side or the distal of this tooth got nice emergence of the preparation sitting um, distopality of the tooth and on the left hand side the emergence could have been placed sorry even further down than it is um, but we do get a much nicer result here's a small diastema distal of a five we can see a lovely preparation over the cusp tip probably very similar to the las vegas institute or lvi style where they asked us to cover the incisal or buckle, sorry, the buckle cusps. But you can see the distal margin has been prepared to the distal buckle corner. And when I highlight the restoration to get a nice broad contact, whoop, we really should have seen the preparation come back to the distal palatal corner or one or two millimetres palatal of the centre of the contact area. Too often, I'll just go back here, too often I see these preps stop here, the tooth has to come out to make contact and then we end up with a big food trap here. Uh, extremely difficult for the patient to keep clean and uh, extremely detrimental to the longevity of our veneers or restorations. So here's another fine example of, of, of the lack of cut through to a diastema prep. You can see this is the veneer as we're going to need on a distal side. We've come out off the margin to make contact and end up with a big palatal food trap. If this preparation had have been made more towards the disto palatal of the tooth or two millimetres, one or two millimetres palatal of the centre of the midline, we would have got a better result. So that food trap could have been rendered with a nicer preparation. One millimetre further back would enable us to emerge the... the um, uh, the distal of the tooth to make a nice broad contact area and as i said at least one millimeter palatal or lingual of the contact or of the center of the contact it really needs to go if you want a broad contact to finish uh, wherever you want your broad contact to finish on the adjacent tooth you need to come back at least one millimeter into the palate and emerge that margin off from that point super important um, for the longevity of these restorations predominantly with veneers so don't forget when you're closing midlines um, central midlines we have enormous propeller here we need to think about uh, so keep that in mind when you're prepping obviously um, uh, that's going to play an enormous role in the shaping of those emergence areas so um what are the advantages and disadvantages uh, of leaving uh, in proximal contact for veneers um, the advantage is obviously on the left-hand side, the conservation of tooth structure. We all know the benefits of minimally invasive uh, preparations uh, and the preservation of enamel. Um, wherever possible, leave as much enamel as you can. I'm telling everyone what they know already, no doubt that enamel is what we need for, sorry, enamel is what we need for enhanced bond strength. 
Um, but the disadvantages of leaving the proximal contact is difficult to access for finishing and polishing your margins clinically. We have decreased aesthetics within proximal margins on show. Um, that's probably a, a big downer, especially over time when the soft tissue retracts or the patient starts getting a little long in the tooth. We can uh, we start showing those natural tooth below. It's obviously difficult in accessing the interproximal stain or caries later down the track for maintenance. Um, but in the last two are marked in orange, the risk of tearing and pressure material below, and it's difficult to section stain models. So for those of you that aren't using digital impressions, you should start thinking to do so. But if you're not, uh, that's another detriment towards um, leaving the interproximal contact. Um, and it's also technically for those technicians who aren't 3D printing models and are still living in the Stone Age, we need to uh, section those uh, in proximal areas. Extremely difficult to do when you, you have two natural teeth or margins butt up against each other. Um, easy to solve digitally, but if you are pouring stone models, it uh, becomes real difficult. So once you break the interproximal contact, as we've discussed for closing of diastemas or black triangles, the advantages, better accessibility for finishing and polishing margins. That's a no brainer, it can be fast to finish. And um, that's when you wanna speed up when the patient's got their veneers in and get them out of the chair and keeping them happy. But most importantly, it gives the technician more control of the proximal contours and proportions. If you don't break contact, the technician is left making the width of that tooth, the width of that tooth. If you break the contact, I can eat in some space for the lateral or eat into some space for the central. And we can now create the proportions that we want, ideally golden proportion, 1 to 1.618, or even a red proportion, the reoccurring aesthetic dentistry proportions required for the ultimate aesthetics in those big veneer cases. Um, but also it, it increases the surface area for bonding. That's a no-brainer. The more surface area, the better chance the tooth has of staying in place. The disadvantages for breaking an interproximal contact, more tooth structure removed. Again, um, the benefits of minimally invasive dentistry have shown time and time again, and uh, increased risks of exposing the dentine. So again, the restoration, uh, the bond of the restoration will suffer. So six non-preparation veneers. These seem to be trending at the moment. Um, we're doing more than I'd um, uh, like to. Some people doing it better than others, even if we prepare the teeth prior to departure. Um, so the dentist prepares them prior to cementation. It's probably going to give you a little bit better result in a one visit prep and cementation than um, complete prepless. But the frontal view here, you'll see our margins. Uh, these margins were tough. Uh, there's micro leakage of the margins. But again, these big food traps in the palatal areas because the, the preparations weren't correct. The new cut through preparations probably could have been more so, but it's definitive improvement. This emergence profile in this area here, if it was prepped back a little bit further here, we could have got a nice emergence back off onto the tooth to get a nice broad contact. But definitely a better result. Um, the new preparations here, feel free to go to the mesiopalatal and distopalatal corners of that tooth if you need to close triangles or close diastemas. This is what I spoke about earlier when the technicians left trying to create improved proportions. We have um, proportions created with a pretty uh, creative technique here. Uh, I'm not sure how the patient's floss is meant to do its job, distal of the central and mesial of the lateral with this S-shaped contact area. Probably won't get it in, and if they do, it's not going to work effectively. We can see current caries in a distal of both those teeth on show, showing that there was already an issue with hygiene or food trap in that area, and now all these people have done have enhanced the problem. If you're going to have veneers done, I'm sorry, what's happened here? Sorry, but there's my shopping. So one second here, we have, if you're going to have the work done, if you're going to have veneer teeth, then commit, commit to the patient, commit to getting a good preparation and commit to preparing the teeth correctly because you can't be a little bit pregnant. Just go for it, get it right and choose a, do a good prep, choose a good lab, get a good result and let the patient enjoy those veneers for the next 20 odd plus years. People ask me all the time, can I mix up my preparations? I've got lovely contact and I'm con uh, between my central 
and uh, lateral in the second quadrant, but I need to close the diastema in the first quadrant between the one and two. Um, there's closing of the diastema between the centrals, but sure you can mix it up. I think these preparations are a bit too aggressive on the lower, but um, as long as you're using a quality lab who understand the pros and cons and the capabilities of the materials they're choosing to work with, I think we can get good results by mixing it up. There's a lovely contact here that we don't want to lose. The contact in between the two centrals should have been prepared more subgingerly. By the time we emerge naturally off those two centre teeth, we're going to get a, um, a pretty ugly black triangle. But sure, mix your preps up as need be. Some people ask me, do I need to smooth the preparation? And I've spent a lot of time studying the benefits of smoothing preparations. And there are some. I've studied the benefits of um, the rough surface um, creating improved mechanical tension. Sure. Um, I don't think it's probably necessary <coughs> to polish. Um, a rough surface for improved mechanical retention would be good, as long as it's not too rough creating any undercuts. Um, but sure, polishing, if you have the time, there's benefits to it, uh, but it's probably unnecessary in lieu of the patient being in pain. Are you left or right-handed? Uh, a lot of the times I can tell my clinicians if they are left or right-handed by looking at their preps. Um, when you're assessing your preparations and you're working on your patient from here and you're looking at an angle, Generally, right-handed patient uh, dentists will end up with a result like this, and left-handed patients will end up with a result being the other way. Uh, so, yeah, ensure you hold the patient perpendicular and look straight down the patient's teeth from behind to make sure your preparations are parallel but perpendicular to the facial plane index. Um, don't be left for the left-handed or right-handed result. Um, be smart. I think um, one dentist sent me this. This is probably unnecessary. Um, for paralleling preps, um, but I thought it was pretty cool, something I should show you. I can't imagine um, anyone wanting to go through that, but the things people do to get good results, huh? So today I want to explain to you prepping to today's technology. Um, years ago, we used to prepare teeth very differently to what's requested today to take advantage of industrial milling technologies. Here on the left-hand side, you'll see a prep with a tooth on it and a burr is then placed inside that in a milling machine to cut the internal surface. But up the top of this preparation, we've got a sharp edge. And the diameter of this sharp edge here is smaller than the diameter of our milling burr. So the milling burr goes in there and over mills that area to ensure that the restoration will fit. You'll see here, this all becomes a little bit of cement space left there, but it can't get in there and mill a incisor, sharp incisor ledge because the milling burr is a larger diameter. And over here, you'll see what's left. And unfortunately, predominantly with anterior teeth, we end up with a thickness differential where that drill radius compensation is. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the restoration has now been thinned out in that area due to that sharp preparation. And on the left-hand side, old school, I can understand. Um, but if you can just round the top of that prep to be 0.4 in diameter, we don't have to eat into that space. So please um, think about that when you're preparing teeth, no sharp edges. Even with traditional manufacture, if you've got a sharp edge and a preparation uh, on a preparation and a technician manufactures the sharp edge with a prep, press technique or a cast technique, that sharp edge is enhancing the propagation or crack propagation issue through that tooth. So not only can you, if you round it off, we'll decrease the chance of fracture or crack, crack propagation. Um, we're also, uh, for digital technology, enabling um, restorations that we're not thinning out in space. Same with posterior teeth. If you've got a sharp edge on a posterior teeth here, the restoration will be rounded by the technology when it mills and on the right hand side which creates a thinner gap and on the right hand side you'll see those sharp edges just rounded perfectly so the um, restoration or the burr can be the restoration can be milled and the burr can travel through there without eating into the uh, restorative space maintaining restoration thickness uh, and integrity long term much thicker result uh, and thickness is strength so 
uh, people ask me when I look inside some of these restorations from our lab and other labs and all labs, uh, we see this area around this area here of marking in red now. Um, and they said it looks like there's someone used a rose head burr and ground down all the way around the fitting surface. If you are seeing that ground down rose head like finish around your um, marginal and cusp, marginal ridge and cusp areas, it means your preparations are too sharp. You must round your preparations around the cusp tips and round off the edges on your triangle on, on your um, marginal ridges. Um, once you do that, you'll see a perfect fitting surface. Otherwise, you'll always end up with this um, um, snake-like uh, trench around your, the circumference of your prep. So if you're seeing that, it's because your preps are too round. Please do us, you, and ultimately your patient a favour just by rounding any sharp edges to enable the mills to work. Um, the diamond tips when people are prepping, we'll just talk a little bit about what I ask for when um, my clinicians or our clinicians or all clinicians are prepping. Um, on the left-hand side, once they're finished uh, preparing, if they tip the restoration or tip the burr uh, away from the path of placement, it results in an undercut. And that's the biggest problem we have. If you tip it into the tooth too far, it leads to excessive tapering of the preparation. And excessive tapering of preparations mean um, the, uh, they come unstuck, they, they debond, um, and there's a lot of science behind uh, the further you tip it, uh, the less it bonds unless you're adding it to part of a bridge, as per this slide shows here. Perfect parallel preparations mean 100% retention, and as the retention, uh, as, as the taper in, in um, as we create more taper, we decrease the retention. So at 100% retention, uh, down here, you'll see 20% taper, uh, sorry, 20% retention at 45 degree taper. So this is fine when you're doing a long span bridge on four teeth because of 45 degree taper. Uh, you can taper it more and more because we're adding those tapers together or those retention amounts together to enhance the bond of the bridge. But for single teeth, you want to be aiming for around about seven, eight, nine degrees uh, where possible. For retention grooves, these are, and there's science behind grooves adding the retention, and if you wish to use them, that's fine. But keep in mind on the left-hand side here, the old technique is to cut a small square groove, which cannot be replicated by milling technology. On the right-hand side, we have a large round groove, which the burr and the diameter of that burr can slide in and out of and create a nice, um, a nice, replication of that retention groove to enhance the retention of the crown but if you see your grooves if you cut these square grooves and your lab's returning crowns with a, a shape similar to this that's exactly why because they just can't get in there to those old school preparation techniques so try and jump on the bandwagon of uh, new and improved and let the technology take care of you which preparation should i use i get the question all the time uh, on the left is chamfer then a bevel and a rolling shoulder, then a shoulder and a beveled shoulder. Basically, I don't really push for one over another. There's definitive benefits to some and some less benefit to other materials. But these days with today's improved materials, stronger restorations, more aesthetic and better fitting restorations, we're seeing a trend to the bevel and the chamfer, uh, predominantly the rolling shoulder more so than the, um, the traditional shoulder, but there's benefits to shoulder preps as well. So look, I'm not gonna uh, push one over another. There's advantages like conservative tooth structure for the feather edge. I think that's a major one you should look at. Um, the bevel is difficult to control. I think that's um, something you should steer clear of because it is hard and time consuming and needs a degree of skill that um, comes with many years of experience. Um, the chamfer is probably best reserved for cast metal and ceramic restorations with porcelain. Um, but the shoulder, shoulder is obviously reserved for porcelain fused to metal and restorations that require more space. But um, shoulder does allow occlusal forces to be to uh, be passed on down the apex of the tooth, where we can take advantages of the periodontal ligament um, more beneficial in that regard. 
this is what I was talking about with that um, the occlusal force coming down uh, on a tooth. And if you're a little man standing on the corner of a, a ledge, you have no issue with um, that. He can take that force all day, and the occlusal force is passed onto the natural tooth and laid down the apex of the tooth for that periodontal ligament to take place and do the work. But if a man's standing on the edge of a beveled cliff and a occlusal force comes down, he slips off, and the restoration fractures are predominantly buckle and shearing off that buckle cusp or whole buckle or facial aspect of that restoration. So if you've got the room, consider a shoulder, but um, a lot of the time we don't. Um, we're really looking towards minimally invasive preps. Um, so, yeah, keep it in mind. Uh, we're happy to work with whoever works for you. Gutter preparations or J troughs, and this slide was prevent, provided by uh, 3M. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go back. Gutter preparations here are a problem. Um, margins can't be detected clearly. This is the biggest thing we see. We see undercuts in these restorations or preparations which can't be reproduced. The parallel walls, if they're too parallel, we can't get restorations on and off. This is the biggest problem we have uh, along with undercuts is these sharp edges. And even traditionally made crowns don't like sharp edges, especially metal free. Any metal free restoration will will be detrimental. It will, will, is detrimental to have a sharp preparation. But the te technologies today simply can't mill those internal surfaces at that sharp edge. So please round them off. And also with your bridges, ensure that you don't have divergent preps. <clears throat> um, in the labial surface, when preparing a crown veneer or any restoration labially, we talk about three planes. The A plane, which is the cervical out to the labial face. The B plane, which is the straight plane down the labial face. And then the C plane, which is the tucking in of that incisal edge. Most clinicians forget to tuck that incisal edge in. Please, when you prepare the tooth, tuck that incisal edge in. Give your technicians the space. Give us room to tuck the incisal edge back and create that enhanced aesthetics on the incisal edge. Uh, it really does make the difference between a great job and an awesome job. Keep it in mind. We'll be very appreciative. AB planes and that last plane there, and even more so, I just tucked that even further around to um, to enable that incisal edge, even this little piece here. I don't know if you can see, but right here. Uh, we ask for that edge to be tucked back in, uh, and that's what we can now enables the technician to tuck the incisal edge and make the case look beautiful. With veneer preparations, it's the only time I really do recommend preparations. Here you can see on the left-hand side the feather edge prep, and there's a lot of benefits to that. The biggest benefit to this is the path of insertion. I can put this path of insertion, I can put this veneer on with a path of insertion of nearly 100 140 degrees, but then the patient bites down it or incises into food. Uh, the food's trying to get down in between the veneer and the preparation, uh, and it's then making your cement or your bond work harder than it needs to. The butt joint in the middle here, I think this is probably the best restoration. When the patient bites down, it's pushing the veneer onto the tooth, and we're asking a lot less of our cement or our bonding material. Um, and we've still got pretty good path of insertion of around about 80 degrees, um, which is pretty good, can come on in any way, shape or form. But this palatal chamfer preparation over here uh, is probably the hardest of all to work with because now we've only got one path of insertion. So getting these on and off the model when we're working and even worse still, getting one of the patient's tooth chair side is a disaster. So when we look at our path of insertion, we've got enormous more opportunities with these two. So I highly recommend the butt joint in the middle because we've still got 80 degrees or plus of path of insertion, but now the incisal force is pushing the veneer onto the tooth. Um, and I think it gives us the best of both worlds. So that's what I recommend for you veneer technicians and clinicians. Here's a prime example of an incisal veneer preparation. Down the bottom right hand side, you'll see the sharp edge. And you'll see the diamond of the burr in yellow that just cannot get into that shape. So it mills, over mills that area, which becomes what we call the drill radius compensation. You can see it up here on the tooth itself. It's eating into all our space on that labio incisal corner. Uh, every technician's disaster. So again, when your preparations come up over the incisal edge and down into the palate, into a palatal chamfer, and here our path of insertion that we want showing all the undercuts in red. 
So we've got to realign that path of insertion so it comes straight down the incisor ledge to eliminate the undercuts. And now you can see I've decreased the uh, drill radius compensation. That's still creating a bit of an issue, but with that path of insertion, now you can see down the bottom right hand side that, that space that's been eaten uh, on that labial surface, and that's eating into very much needed space for aesthetics, especially when you have a labial incrine tooth that's probably devitalized and we need every bit of space we can get to hide the discoloration and retrocline that incisal edge of that tooth for aesthetics. Again, that's what it looks like with technology that's not industrial. You see a lot of these, um, that's, that's at 0.5 of a millimetre uh, milling burr. Um, and that's what your average mills do today. We're lucky enough to be milling a lot smaller than that. Our burrs go a lot smaller, so our drill radius compensation can be refined. But your average mill, predominantly a chair side mill, will be eating in that much space unless you round your preps. So what burrs do we recommend you, we use? Um, here you'll see um, the, um, this football shaped, ideal for the preparation of palatal surfaces and upper anterior teeth. It's also the occlusal surfaces of molar. This is a survey I've done across our high-end um, dentists for preparing their teeth and their recommendations. This one is useful for margins and monolithic restorations, has a fine taper for the proximal reduction of teeth. This one's more suited towards the shoulder prep due to its flat end. And the one on the right here is too curved for shoulder preps, but good for chamfer margins, uh, depending on what shoulder prep or what chamfer margin or which type of margin you are looking to produce, um, I would choose the burr accordingly. Just quickly on those burrs, on the left-hand side, you'll see the morphology of a step diamond burr. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the same thing at a 64 micron grit size. This is what it looks like under um, at 50 microns. It's um, 350 times magnification. On the left-hand side, you'll see the medium grit diamond burr at 500 microns and up close below it at 100 microns. In the middle is the fine grip burr and on the right hand side an extra fine grip burr. What I found very interesting when I looked at these studies, this is the surfaces treated with a fine, an extra fine uh, and a medium grip burr. The top left or, can, or A is the control surface, B is a medium grip burr, C is a fine grip burr and the bottom right corner D is an extra fine grit burr. What I found interesting was the roughest surface here seemed to be the fine grit burr, which appears at the same magnification to have better mechanical retention than a medium grit burr. Unusual and was quite amazed when I found that, so I thought I'd throw it in here. So maybe you might wish to finish your restoration preparations or finish your preparations with a, a fine grit burr um, to create what I think would be a better mechanical retentive finish. So once you've prepped it, you need to check your prep. If you've got digital technologies, use them. If you've got the best of the digital technology, use their capabilities to be able to check the clearance. This is a Trios and the Trios and the Medit both have um, technology to enable us to check how much clearance you've given your technician. And you'll see here, the yellow just here is reflective of around about 1.2 millimetres of space. The green is reflective of 1.7. So we've got tons of space here uh, for this restoration. It's good to go out. You're not going to get a call from your lab tech saying, I've got insufficient space. Should I return the case and get the patient back? Should I reduce the preparation and mark the model and hope the restoration fits? Or should I eat it into the posing dentition and, uh, and cut down virgin tooth? All three things that this technology steer clear of. And I highly recommend... Um, the, the purchase of the better technologies that give us this sort of information. Again, think about the path of insertion. In this case here, we can see the lingual of the prepared lower molar uh, showing that there's a path of insertion discrepancy uh, on the proximal wall and the lingual. So this technology shows you this, so you might wish to address that prior to sending to your lab. But not only for your preparations, but for your adjacent tooth, when you have those measurely inclined posterior adjacent teeth and distally inclined anteriorly adjacent teeth showing orange, red, or even green, you may wish to go and buzz those uh, to create a path of insertion for your restoration. So these first class scanning technologies like the three shape system here, 
Uh, Matic can do it as well. Can really enable you to measure your thicknesses and your um, reduction with restorations to ensure your technician has everything he or she needs to get a perfect result for you and your patient. There's technology attached to that as well. Remember high definition photography. Um, a lot of the times what you see on the screen when you're scanning is not what we see when it arrives in the lab. It's a quick artist impersonation to speed up your scanner. So when you're looking at scanning technology, don't think that what you see on the screen during the scan is the accuracy that comes. Um, you're really looking to the detail and, and what's written behind the, behind the scenes. Or well, feel free to contact me or, or Shirley who can talk about the benefits and the pros and cons of each of those leading scanners um, to give you uh, the most suited scanner for your needs and your patients in your clinic. If you have a fit to denture case, these is where this is where another benefit these scanners scan the tooth quickly, prepare the tooth and scan it again. I'll show you another view here. You can see there's the um, the molar before prepared. We take a quick scan. We then prepare the tooth and there's the molar ghosted over the top. And once we finalise the prep, we make the tooth the new restoration exactly the same shape by use of what we call copy milling. We cement the tooth and the denture just snaps into place guaranteed to fit because the new tooth is exactly the same shape as the pre-prepared tooth. If you're doing pre-deprogrammers or um, night splints, Michigan splints, neuromuscular orthotics, and you need to scan this patient in an open position, compliments of knowing where the pre-deprogramming position may be, or maybe you've spent months tensing the patient uh, for your orthognathic, uh, for your um, neuromuscular orthotic devices, you can now scan the patient in that orthognathic or neuromuscular position uh, and we can print the models and mount them uh, in that position. So don't think because you've got a new open bite position you need to portray or articulate to the, to the lab. Uh, that can be easily achieved with these technologies. So check your impression. Before it goes out, I'm going to finish up with a few tips and tricks on how to test your impression. Traditionally, dentists would look into the impression, double check there's no drags, or at least we hope they did. Um, but these days, have a look at your scan. Here's a good example of a scan that wasn't checked. And you'll see once in this, on this uh, down here, if I turn it to black and white, you'll see this flashing on that labial corner of the tooth. So look for flashing. The biggest giveaway besides missing data is flashing on distal marginal ridges and mesial marginal ridges, but also on labio incisal corners of anterior teeth. Um, you'll see the big problem of flashing here. The scan was redone. We quality control your scans in. We hope we pick up on as many discrepancies as possible. But again, you've wasted your time letting the patient go. Have a quick look, assess your scan, see if there's discrepancies and tackle it accordingly. Take the new scan, have another look now and you can easily see that discrepancy in flash has now disappeared. Have a look at your scans. Top left corner, flash appearing, distolabial, sorry. <clears throat> flash appearing, distolabial um, corner, down here in black and white, highlighted. A lot of scanners have the capability to go to black and white and that just shows more contrast to enable you to check that. The rescan top right, no more issue, love it, well done. Again, the same problem. The new scan, you can see the new scan, all of that area is now gone, where you can see the original has all this flashing up in this, oh, up in this area here. Flash here and flash here. Have a look for that. And the, uh, that's what was a giveaway for an accurate scan. Down the bottom right here, see the flash here and here as opposed to the rescan and the same here and here with the rescan it's gone that's the biggest giveaway for inaccurate data labio incisal corners the same thing here you'll see the labio incisal has a really sharp edge here if you see a sharp edge or what looks to be a little bit of flash in the labio incisal corners of your preps either a it's an inaccurate scan or B, if it's not, you need to go and smoothen it out for reasons we spoke about before with drill radius compensation. You'll see here in black and white that flashing highlighted. You've got to get rid of that. It's problematic. Your crowns just won't fit. There's a good example of that flash and those sharp edges. There's no way that preparation was done that shape. So if you see that, pull it up. 
The other thing is you've checked your margins, you've checked your flash, you've checked the adjacent tooth, you've got a great prep here, there's a little bit of an issue with flash there, but you've double checked with the patient, it's definitely right. But look at this area here in the contact, uh, in, the, in the contact area. This dentist was so focused on checking the margins and the preps were correct that they forgot all about the contact area and the pontic area. You see this massive void here, which is just uh, a discrepancy in, in stitch. So please don't just focus on what's happening on your preparation site. Please focus on everything that's needed. If you saw that in your uh, traditional impression, you saw a, an area where a pontic needs to be manufactured, you definitely get rid of that. And of course, if you've got bleeding, then bite the bullet, finish your preparation the best you can, temporize your best you can, and get the patient back for the scan later. Because this is not doing any favors for any patient or any clinician. When we get this in, we just simply can't see any margins. We don't know where the finishing is. And this is sort of um, as bad as it gets. I understand clinically it's difficult. The patient's gagging. There's blood everywhere. The nurse is late. The chair stopped working. The water runs out. I get it. It's difficult. But bite the bullet. Temporize the best you can. Get the patient back in. And deal with it later. On the left-hand side, you see a scan that came in and we uh, that can and you can easily see there's an issue there, and that's what happens when there's saliva on the teeth. You can even see where two bubbles of saliva have popped or burst during just before the scan. So if you don't see the same definition in your scan, in your scan that you can see in the patient's natural teeth, go and dry the teeth. It just can be with a quick blow dry, a quick spray, uh, and scan the teeth dry so saliva doesn't show up as slurry would in a model when it's being poured. Keep that in mind. It's very important. So here's Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. We can't blame the technology when we make mistakes. This technology is good. It works. It's accuracy. It is now been tried and tested to be better than traditional techniques. But it's not here to replace dentists and technicians. They're here to enhance us. Please. Use them to your benefit. Double check what you're doing. Double check your impressions. Double check your scans. Utilize the technology to increase our capabilities. Don't shortcut what we need to do thinking you've invested in technology. I can now shortcut my techniques. Good prosthetics don't come by shortcuts. There are no shortcuts to good prosthetics. Remember that. And remember, first impressions last. The last thing we need to talk about once all that's going, once you've done all that, how to communicate with your lab once you've taken your scan. Currently, we have the Race Portal, 3Shape Communicate, Medit Link, Dropbox, WeTransfer, email, WhatsApp, text, phone. It comes and comes and comes. We need to streamline this so we don't lose ourselves in, in our communications. We want to make sure all of our scanning and our communications, photos and everything comes together into one to make sure we get... Uh, all that information on day one to make sure the job goes out, correct, on time, first time, perfect. So we ask you, if possible, use the race portal for any information such as videos, photos, lab cards, etc., or any of the iOS portals, 3Shape Communicate, MeditLink, anything that's linked currently with your scanner, um, use that. It's the best way of doing it. Attach your photos, attach your information to that. And where necessary, pick up the phone, give us a call or send us an email should that be your chosen correct. But try to eliminate all of the Dropbox transfers, WhatsApps, texts, um, all into the race portal and just use the iOS and, and phone us where need be. That's the best way. For more information on any of that, contact customer support, racedental.com.au. We've got a team of customer support people here who will look after you. Alternatively, feel free to contact me, Matt, at racedental.com.au. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to throw it over now to Shirley. I know we're low on time, Shirley. Do we have any questions we may be able to address prior to jump and finish? Yeah, there are just a couple of questions that have come up. Now, one of them is, would you recommend doing a full arch scan or just a quadrant scan with that? Yeah, look, fantastic question, and one we get asked a lot. Um, I understand the benefits of a triple tray impression. 
I understand the benefits of time saving when you do a quick quadrant scan. And sure, quadrant scans are okay, but the benefits of full arch impressions are endless. The major one is with a full arch scan, we've got canine guidance or group function and canine guidance or group function. Same with the lower, we've got that canine guidance and a group function. So we know exactly how that lower jaw articulates and, and, excur ex um, and excursions with the opposing. If we move one side of it, we know exactly how it articulates through canine guidance or group function on this side. But on this side, it travels straight across. We don't know that it drops because we have no canine guidance or group function. So the palatal cusps or the anatomy in your posterior teeth when we manufacture is often makes high contact or high bites because we're unable to know what shape it should be. So feel free to take a full arch impression so the technicians know exactly how to shape that posterior anatomy so you don't have high bites in your, on your marginal ridges and your um, uh, palatal cusps, predominantly your mesiopalatal cusps. If you're reducing posterior mesiopalatal cusps, predominantly on upper restorations, it, predominantly, it would probably be coming from triple trail quadrant impressions. So we always ask for full arch impressions where possible. Uh, also, centric relation or, or can be found with by use of wear facets a lot easier than if we're balancing two quadrant impressions. So that's a great question. I'm glad that's asked. All right, there is another question here that I've got. Now, I know it looks like we did talk about a lot of crown work, but there is a question here to ask um, whether or not you would recommend scanning with for dentures. Um, another good question. The scanners are mucostatic. Um, so they only scan by looking at something and it's a static impression. If you're taking a tooth borne, rest if we're making a tooth borne restoration, like a crown, a bridge, or a cobalt chrome, or even a small unilateral denture where we're clasping natural tooth, then the scan is going to take a better impression than a traditional impression. But a denture, let's say a full impression for a full arch denture, requires the mucocompressive impression. We want to compress that mucosa sufficiently enough to create suction or what we call adhesion and cohesion from the manufactured post dam in the denture to make sure the denture um, has the best chance of staying in the mouth as possible. So uh, for full arch dentures, I would recommend a muco compressive impression. So get your old school alginate out and take your impression, but for everything tooth borne, digital technology is far better. All right, there is one last question I've got here, I believe, from Janet. Um, is the race dental portal the comment box when you scan? Um, no. The, co the comment box is part of your lab card, or what they call the RX. Is, um, so all of your comments and your attachments can be put into the comments and attachments section into your RX or your lab card, and that gets sent off through the iOS portal, which is um, your 3 show Communicate or your Medit link or whatever the corresponding uh, technologies attached to the scanner. The race portal, you'll need to make contact with us at customer support at Race Dental, and we will give you the details on how to log on from any computer over the internet. And it's like Dropbox, but it's a, a race specific, secure uh, information portal that um, we can now communicate through with um, no risk of, uh, of any of the information being leaked out into a non-secure site. So no, the race portal is not what's connected to your scanner. It is a drop box for race users. Any other questions, Shirley? I think that is all for today. All right, it was a pretty long day. We appreciate that. Don't forget next year or next month's webinar series is in and around the sales, manufacturing benefits of custom made laminated mouth guards and uh, the race guards. So feel free to tap in then. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of work coming up this year. We've got an exciting program for the year, which will be announced next month. So thank you for signing in. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, the future is now. Go out there and grab it. Stay safe, everyone. We'll see you soon, hopefully next month. Be safe.